So let's uh, look at mirror neurons. So back in the 90s, my colleagues in Parma in Italy uh, were studying an area in the front of the monkey brain. You can see it called F5. And uh, what we see at bottom right is that when the monkey was, in this case, carrying out a precision pinch to pick up a piece of food, this particular cell they were recording from fired vigorously. So we're seeing 10 different occasions on which the cell fires vigorously, and the histogram says this is a cell that really cares about the monkey doing a precision pinch. And then almost by chance, one day, um, when the experimenter was placing a piece of food on the tray before handing it to the monkey, uh, they realized this cell was firing in this case as well. So a mirror neuron is one that is active for the monkey executing a specific range of grasps and also for observing someone else carrying out a somewhat similar range of grasps. And I just want to make a technical point. There are other neurons, for example, canonical neurons that fire when the monkey is doing the action but not when he sees the action. So it's an important observation from the monkey where we can look cell by cell to say, in the mirror system, there are lots and lots of cells that aren't mirror neurons. Now, he, here from the same uh, group uh, with other colleagues is a study not on action, but on an emotion, in this case, disgust. And so the two experimental conditions now, we're in uh, Sarah Jane's realm of uh, fMRI, brain imaging with humans, and uh, in one case, and this is the red spots that you can see distributed on the brain, uh, the, the subject is asked to smell something disgusting. And in the other case, the person is asked to look at someone experiencing something disgusting. And those are the um, blue dots. And then the white dots are where we have overlap. So I want to make two points. One is you might say there is a mirror system. We're not able to talk about individual neurons, but a mirror system for disgust. But lots of neurons are active for the observation. Lots of neurons are active for the execution in addition to this overlap. So I think that's an important caveat to bear in mind. And now in this particular study from uh, Buccino and colleagues at Parma and Milan, uh, on the left we have the uh, human subject who's being imaged is watching a little video. So here we see some samples. Uh, watching a dog biting, watching a monkey biting, watching a human biting. And as you can see from those blue circles I've distributed down the right-hand brains on the left-hand side, that mirror neuron system, as they call it, is pretty much active in each case. On the other hand, actually it was the other mouth, um, when they turn to communicative actions, a person talking, uh, but you didn't hear, a vi didn't hear a soundtrack, just seeing their... Uh, lip reading, as it were, a monkey teeth chattering and so on, a dog barking. In this case, as we see with the circled area, the mirror system that was active for speech and was a little bit active for the monkey didn't react to the dog. So Buccino and his colleagues said, well, actions belonging to the observer's motor repertoire are mapped on the observer's motor system. But of course, we recognize what the dog is doing. And as we, we heard from Dr. Kaminsky, um, for many of us, social interactions with dogs are at least as important as social interactions with humans. So that restricting everything to mirror neurons which overlap between our own actions and our observations is too limited a perspective. And uh, thus my slogan, uh, mirror neurons and more. Now, Galesi, Kaisers, and Rizzolatti, co-authors of the previous studies, uh, felt that mirror neurons were the secret for what they call social cognition. Let's just read a short quote. We posit that mirror mechanisms allow us to directly understand the meaning of the actions and emotions of others by internally replicating, simulating them, in other words, without any conceptual reasoning. And another phrase for this view is putting oneself in the other's shoes. So let's do... Um, a scientific study together, shall we? So um, before I show you this test of your mirror neuron system, I just want to make a distinction. 
Um, most of the talks we've heard, but not all of them, have approached theory of mind in terms of can you attribute mental states to the other? What are their beliefs? What are their intentions? But I want to stress that we didn't evolve to passively sit around judging other people's intentions. We evolved to interact with other people. And so I will use social cognition as the umbrella term with theory of mind just part of it, but so we not only recognize what others are doing, but do so in a way that can help guide our own actions. So to test the mirror neuron account of social cognition, I want you to treat the next slide, there are gonna be three frames. I want you to treat it as a video and just read the frames from top to bottom and see how you feel. So when you got to the bottom, did you feel a little twinge of smile or a little empathy? How many of you felt empathetic in looking at Okay, so we have a few, I read about a third of you believe in the mirror, the mirror theory of, <laughs> of, of um. okay, now for my next number, um, I'm going to see, hopefully I can get even less of you to agree with the mirror theory. Um, I want you to imagine that you have spent the whole day preparing an absolutely superb dinner. And at last you sit down across the table as you present your guest with the food expecting a reaction of delight, and this is what you see. <laughs> now it's interesting, you, like my wife, responded with laughter to this. However, I would suggest that had it'd been the real situation in which your guest had reacted like this, you would not have laughed. Uh, you would have thought, what a bastard, or <laughs> what an uneducated oaf who doesn't appreciate fine cuisine. So, so the point is that you had to recognize in some subconscious way the expression of disgust, but in no way did you put yourself in that person's shoes. If anything, you wanted to knock them out of their shoes at, at that moment. So uh, Mark Genero, a colleague of mine who died recently, uh, gave us some insight by saying, let's break away from just recognizing the other to thinking about social interactions. And, and, and so this is a fairly complicated diagram. But the idea is that as you observe the other, you'll come up with some idea of their action or their intentions. And then as you begin to plan, and again, it might not be conscious, but as you begin to plan your response, you're already weighing the social consequences in terms of your own beliefs and desires. So in this case, we saw that the effort you'd put into preparing the, um, the dinner and your expectation of delight caused you to respond in a very different way from the sympathy you might have felt if that person was reacting to, to something in another context. So the point Mark makes is that each agent's brain builds a representation both of her own intended actions and the potential actions of the other agent with whom he interacts. And without getting into the technicalities of this, there's an interesting point that is often overlooked by talking, people talking about mirror neurons because if you're using the same neurons to code the other person's actions and your own actions, how do you know what you're thinking versus what they're doing? So it's what's called the binding problem, knowing what goes with, with which agent. But anyway, the crucial point is that you're continually making predictions and estimates about the social consequences. And so if those predictions are defied, then you'll react in a very different way from otherwise. Okay, in the remaining time, I want to get into this anthropogeny gig and look at uh, evolution. And the, the question then is to use our, um, leaving aside the dolphins and the elephants for the moment, um, we have two main comparison points highlighted here, the macaque monkey with our common ancestor 25 million years ago, and the chimpanzee with our last common ancestor five to seven million years ago. Well. We've already learned about chimpanzees, so let's get back to the monkeys. So first, I just want to briefly mention a study of baboons in Botswana. There's a limerick there. There's a competition. I want, you know, after this, there was a baboon in Botswana who blah, 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 you know, who fell in love with a banana. But uh, anyway, uh, the other three lines, they're up to you. Okay. So anyway, here we see 
Here we see Dorothy Cheney and Robert Seyfarth in Botswana with the bonobos they've been studying. And I, I think one of the things that's very clear from these pictures is there's a lot of social interaction going on that lies outside the scope of their studies. And um, the, the one study I have time to show you is this idea of contact barks that the, uh, I wish I had Tetsura's ability to, to create the sounds of the, the subject. So instead, I will take a moment to give you the sound of this computer. OK, continuing. <laughs> All right, so they make these contact barks as they move through the trees if they're isolated. Now, the interesting thing they studied was that um, what if they play back a contact bark? When, when will the, uh, an adult female respond? Or when will not any baboon respond? And it said if they were locomoting rather than sitting feeding, if they were far away from the others, or if they were the rear of the troop, they were much more attentive to, to this contact bark. So the suggestion is this was based on the animal state, not its recognition of the state of others. And the test they, they made of this was they um, looked at mothers in relation to an infant getting separated, and there was no special increase in a mother's emission of the contact box if she saw that her own infant was in need. And they compared this to saying, it's as if a human said, I'm OK, so everyone else must be OK too. So their point then is that baboon contact box, at least, don't have anything to do with theory of mind in this sense of seeing the other's belief state or mental state as different from one's own. So the last study I want to bring to your attention, because it not only looks at macaque monkeys, uh, the, the same sort of monkeys that gave us the original mirror neurons, uh, but also um, gives us, in fact, more neurophysiological data from Riken Brain Science Institute in uh, just outside Tokyo with uh, Iriki and Fuji. And the, the background for this is that Iriki's group had taught these monkeys how to use a rake to retrieve food, which was not otherwise in their reach. And what is interesting here is that they found a cell in the parietal cortex responsive to touch to the inside of the hand. And they found this cell was also responsive to visual stimuli. And it was responsive to these visual stimuli just within the hand. In other words, where there might be an object that was either just about to be or was being touched. But once the monkey had been taught to use the tool, then this whole raking area became part of the visual field that was relevant to activating this uh, hand-sensitive cell. And similarly, if we looked at a cell whose somatosensory field, whose touch field was the shoulder girdle, then the, without tool use, there was what was within reach of the hand by itself, but this was extended. So there's this interesting thing that the brain is actually changing, in this case, not on a social context, uh, but on a, a, a practical context in terms of what can tools allow me to do, what part of the world becomes within my reach. So with this, they turned to this interesting situation where they had two monkeys uh, positioned at a table. And what you find is that when you put two monkeys together and there's food within reach of both of them, very quickly one establishes itself as dominant and will always get to take the food if it's in their common area. So we see three cases here. Position A, the reaching areas are disjoint. So M2, in this case the submissive monkey, can grab food whenever it's placed within his reach. But if we now move them into this position where this is the region both can reach, then there's only this very small probability, shown by this sliver here, of reaching, a very small probability of reaching by the, the s subordinate monkey in the shared area. And just a little bit more when it's in the reach of the monkey's right hand, obviously a right-handed monkey. And then what they found was that there were state-dependent neurons in the, frontal cort in the prefrontal cortex, a lot more data that we are not going to go into. But here you can see that M1 is differentially coding position A from B and C, and we get a different coding here with a neuron in M2, so that they're aware of these regions that are socially different depending on their relative standing at the table. But here's the real surprise, and I got to meet the monkeys doing this in, uh, in Riken. Now, these monkeys had previously been trained on how to use a rake, 
So you give them all a rake, and now here's this area where both can reach, which they couldn't reach before with their bare hands, and the subordinate monkey competes. His, his notion of dominance does not extend to using a rake. He's got it for, hey, I can't go where his hand can go, but hey, that's not where his hand's going, so it's okay. So um, Iriki and, and Fuji comment, this seems strange to us humans, but it's understandable if we think that monkeys lack the ability to imagine the environment from another's point of view. That links back to Sarah Jane's uh, director task. And so what they're saying, in this case, Tullius created an ethologically novel condition of social conflict that the monkey's adaptive neural system was ill-equipped to deal with. So of course, by this stage, you may be saying, well, you've showed conclusively that baboons and macaque monkeys don't really have theory of mind, so why even mention them? And, and so I close with uh, a claim. And that is that if we look at the comparison between the fine details of neural recording, as we saw uh, for the macaque, shown here at bottom left, if we look at the rather crude information about here are a few chunks of brain that are getting active, but we haven't a clue about what individual neurons are doing that we have with the human. And if we have these various evolutionary relationships, then the claim with which I leave you, and I hope to have given you some feeling for it, is that if we study mirror neurons and more, those larger circuits in the monkey, then that will lead us to a deeper understanding of what's going on in our own brains and with our capacity for social cognition. Thank you very much.